praise in Jesus' name. I'm Bishop Chester Wright, and it is uh, my privilege to be with you today on Antioch West Virtual Live. <laughs> um, this is a special day, a special weekend. Uh, I served in the military. My dad was a 30-year Navy veteran who served, fought in three wars. So I give him special honor today, along with all of you who, uh, who have also served. Uh, I have something a little different. I, to me, I think it's a little different. Um, I'm going to say this to you. Um, some of you may not like this today. Others may believe it's about the best thing you've ever heard. That's not going to have to do with me and my delivery. It's going to be where you are. Uh, it's going to be determined by where you are in your faith or lack of it, in your relationship with God or lack of it. Um, the Lord pointed me to these verses a, a few days ago, and I waited and wondered when I was supposed to use them, and he made it very clear that this is uh, the day. Um, I'd like to read you some verses. And uh, they're taken from James chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. James says, uh, Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that, or for that reason, for this cause, ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, some have taken words like this, turned them into platitudes. Platitudes are things we repeat. We say them with our lips, but our heart is not connected to our words. What, what our real life is, is not expressed by our words. The Bible says also in James that be not uh, a be a doer word of the word and not just a hearer, deceiving your own self. It's uh this is the question the Lord asked when I read these words. He says, "What is your life?" That's the question we're asking today. What is your life? He asked that question. And there's a lot of facets to that question. But today I want to focus on the fact that when he asks, what is your life? There's two basic answers to that question. One would be that my life belongs to him. I am his. I was, a, I was bought with a price. His shed blood. I am not my own. The other is, my life is mine. That's the opposite of this. Again, there are many facets to this, but I'm focusing on these two. The other is, my life is mine. I will do what I want, when I want, how I want it. James, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, 
is actually pointing out the fallacy of the second and encouraging the first. You know, <laughs> it's not really my life. I drove here this morning. It's raining a little bit here in Maryland. And uh, uh, there were signs on the side of the road with numbers on them. 50, 45, 35, 25. Those signs dared to presume to tell me how fast I could go to get to Pastor Joel Wright's house today to be able to be with you. It dared to do that. Now, I can look at those signs and say they're just inconveniences. They are, I can ignore them. I don't even have to look at them. But then again, there is an authority behind those signs that says we do have the right to tell you how fast you're going to drive on this road. I may not like it. And, you know, if I get away with it, I can think, okay, well, I got away with it. Uh, see there, I can do what I want. But we all know it's possible and sometimes likely that we will not get away with it. We'll not get away with it. So the point being in this conversation today is the Lord is speaking through the Apostle James and he's talking to us today that we should soberly, soberly there's not talking about the fact whether or not you're drinking. A lot of people don't drink at all, but they're drunk. They're drunk on their self-importance. They're drunk on their self-will. They're drunk on their likes and dislikes. And those things all cause them to not be as clear thinking as possible. They're drunk on that. I like, I want, uh, I don't, I don't like. So I can express all of that. And to a certain degree, God has allowed some latitude in the fulfillment or us being able to basically attempt to fulfill our likes and dislikes, but it's a very limited window. There's a verse in the scripture that says, man makes the decisions, but God determines the outcome of them. This is basically the message of this passage from James. You can decide and say, I'm going to go to here. I'm going to do there. I don't care what God wants. I don't care what anybody else wants. I can, I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it. But James is saying, uh, is that really possible? I don't know anybody that is able to accomplish doing everything they want to do when they want to do it, how they want to do it. I don't know anybody because it's not possible. Now, some people resent the fact that God is expecting them to acknowledge that he's God. But when I, when, I, when I look at this verse, it says, what is your life? And I apply that question to myself. I, I wouldn't change anything. The good days, the bad days, the laughter, the tears. All of those things are seasonings in God's process to bring me to the place he wants me to be in him. All of those things allow me the opportunity to not only know him, but to know me. All of those things. And, and we have a tendency to want our lives to be pain-free, problem-free, pressure-free. That's what we like. Well, the Lord said to me many years ago, he spoke in my vernacular. He said, this ain't heaven. On purpose, it's not heaven. 
because my, the life he has promised is eternal life, not a, a wisp of a vapor. Now, uh, you may know what, cloud, what, what fog is, but if you fly much, you know that fog is just clouds that are down at, the, at elevation zero, ground level. And when you're flying and you're flying through those clouds, thank God for instruments. Thank God the pilot's got instruments. Because if you're flying through those clouds, you don't know where you are. You can't see where you're going. It's just a vapor. Those clouds are just vapor. But they block my ability to see where I've been and where I'm going. And it's a... It never ceases to amaze me when you take off on a, a cold, rainy day from the airport and it's, there's rain falling and there's rain on the window of the, of the plane and, and you're looking out the window at the ground and, and you're taking off and you, you begin to cl climb and then you reach a certain altitude, you go into the cloud, you can't see anything. And various lengths of time, you come out of that cloud and on top of that cloud, on top of that vapor, you break through into cloudless sky, sunshine. On the ground, that's not what life looks like. You come through the vapor, get on the other side, it's a different world altogether. And then if the weather is similar to that at your destination, you come out of this bright, clear sunshine. You go back into that vapor that you can't see where you're going. That's why the pilot has instruments that let him know uh, what, uh, uh, what the, uh, uh, whether the plane is level or not, or if it's descending, what altitude it's at, whether it's descending or ascending and all of that. That's how he gets through the cloud safety, safely. Then he comes out of the bottom of the cloud. You can see the ground again, but you don't see blue sky anymore. But the Lord equated my life to the cloud. It's just a vapor. Actually, uh, a couple of translations uh, get a little more specific. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17 in the Amplified says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a city and spend a year there and carry on our business at and make money. Yet you do not know the least thing about what may happen tomorrow. I don't even know what's going to happen in the next 60 seconds. I can assume I know. I can plan to know. But I have no idea what may happen in the next 60 seconds. And trust me, 60 seconds is a long time when in a, a fraction of a second, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, everything could change. I don't have, I don't have any guarantee of what the next moment's going to be. Forget the next minute, the next hour, the next day. Now, you may not like the idea that someone is in control of all of that that I can't control. But to me, it gives me great comfort, great assurance, great peace to know, first of all, to acknowledge that I'm not in control of anything. I can't even make my, my uh, heart beat the next second. Now, I've got this Apple Watch, and it's got a heart rate monitor on it. And uh, sometimes I'm in a situation where I'm kind of bored and I'll, watch, I'll look at the heart rate and I've learned that I can get still enough and slow my breathing rate down enough, I can watch my heart rate drop. Uh, but I don't start my heart. I don't speed up my heart, slow it down really I'm not in control of the next beat of my heart. The instrument can measure how many times my heart is beating each minute, but I can't make my heart beat. 
I'm not in control of all of that. Now, there are people that resent that they're not in control. <laughs> There's a platitude that goes, you need to get a life. Well, I got a life. The question is, so do you... You've got a life too. The question is, what are you going to do with that life? What are you doing with that life? The absolute total deception that some people live in that they think they're in control. <coughs> you, you have a right to make your decisions. You have absolutely no ability to determine how they're going to turn out. You can't make your decisions turn out the way you want them to. You can't do it. I can't do it. Nobody can do it. Well, of course, those that don't want to acknowledge that there is a God and that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, God of heaven and earth, that he is the Lord or the Greek word is supreme ruler of heaven and earth. If you resent that because you want to be God, because you want to make out your own decisions, then, hey, I, that's your privilege for here and now. That's your privilege for here and now. It's not your privilege after death. In fact, the Bible says no man has the power to retain the spirit in death. So while your heart's still beating and you're breathing, you've got a measure of control, at least in dis making decisions. But when it comes time to die, I can't hang on to my spirit and say, wait a minute, I'm not dying. What is your life? So verse 14, the Amplified says, you do not know the least thing about what may happen tomorrow. What is the nature of your life? You are really but a wisp of vapor, a puff of smoke, a mist that is visible for a little while and then disappears into thin air. Now, of course, my soul is eternal, is eternal. My soul is a part of me. It is me. It is eternal. This flesh, this body is only the house that I live in. My, the real me is my soul. My me, I live in this body. That's why as you get older, you wonder why it is. I look in the mirror and I, I can't relate to that person. I look at pictures. I go, who, who is that? Because my soul is eternal and doesn't age. Only the house it lives in ages. God allows that for those who will even consider the facts instead of living the opposite of sober, not clear thinking, not seeing things the way they really are, but the way that they want them to be. I can so persuade myself that things are the way I want them to be, I become blind to the way things really are. And so... I, if, if I am, if God is trying to get my attention and he uses his word like this to get my attention, that's why he said, take hear, heed how you hear. He also said, take heed what you hear because they, you know who the, they are, they are the people this nameless, faceless group, they, that we use as the excuse to justify us thinking and doing and not thinking and not doing, we, we justify that. If I don't want to think this, then they don't think this. If I don't want to do this, well, they don't do this. Well, if I want to do it, well, they do it. If I want to think this, well, they think it. And so I use this faceless, massless, oh, so you may be able to put a face on it, but the they that is our perpetual excuse. It's not a they, it's an I am. And he is the point of reference. You can use they as a point of reference. You can use the I am as the point of reference. You can't do both. You're going to do one or the other. The I am gave us his word so that we can see things from his perspective because his perspective is eternal. His perspective is eternal, not temporary. My life is temporary. It's just a vapor. 
Well, I've lived 75 years. That's not a vapor. And compared to the infinite God, <laughs> I don't even know if you could call it a vapor in comparison to the infinite God. In comparison to the, to the eternity that's coming, you can't, call, you can't call my 75 years much more than a vapor compared to endless time in eternity. And yet the problem is, the temporary nature of this life is very deceptive. It allows us to lose ourselves in the temporary, the temporal, and not even see beyond it. And that's what the Lord is trying to get across to us. The next verse in the Amplified says, You ought instead to say, If the Lord is willing, we shall live and we shall do this or that, thing, but as it is, you boast falsely in your presumption and your self-conceit. This is the Amplified. I'm not speaking, I'm reading. All such boasting is wrong. Let me read, read that verse to you again. Verse 16, the Amplified. But as it is, you boast falsely in your presumption and your self-conceit. All such boasting is wrong. It is easy to act like you're the end all to be all till you get cancer or even COVID and you find out you don't have any choice over all that. How many people do I know, do you know, that had clear indicators that something was wrong, but they didn't, know, they didn't want to know what was wrong with them. So they didn't go to the, go to the doctor and the doctor does the diagnosis and says, you know, if you would have come in months ago, we could have dealt with this, but you waited too long. Why do we wait? Why is it we don't want to know what the doctor says or the lawyer says or the preacher? Why is it we don't want to know what they say? Because we want to delude ourselves in believing we're in control, we're in charge, we want to do what we want to do. And by the time the situation gets to the point that it's beyond our ability to continue to deny it, way too often it's too late. All because we don't believe that God is ultimately in control. The last verse of the Amplified says, verse 17, so any person who knows what is right to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. I... I I know way too many Christians that have adopted the world's definition of what sin is and isn't, and they call it morality. But in God, the worst things, sins we commit are not the things we do we shouldn't do, but the things we should do that we don't do because we don't want to do them. Because obedience, just the idea of obeying God is is an acknowledgement that I'm not in control, that somebody has the authority to tell me what right and wrong is. Somebody has the authority to expect me to do the right and not do the wrong. And so obedience alone is humbling all by itself because it means I'm not in charge. This is, this is Memorial Day weekend, giving honor to those who have served in the military in our country. Ask any military person if they like every order that's given to them on any level by their immediate supervisor or anyone up the chain of command. Ask if they like that. No. In fact, every military person knows the likelihood is far greater that you're not going to like the order, whether it's a temporary one or a major one, then that you will like it. You know, they call it a dream sheet. It's coming time for you to get transferred and there's options out there and you write down on your dream sheet the place you'd like to be stationed, the ship, the squadron or whatever it would be and what, you, what, what you'd like to do. <laughs> in my opinion, most of the time, that's an exercise in futility because it's, it's called the good of the service. You can put anything you want on your dream sheet, but they're going to put you where they need you to be. 
They're going to give you the job to do they need you to do. You signed up for it. You didn't sign up to get what you want, to go where you want, join the Navy, see the world. <laughs> yeah, I guess technically that happens. But you don't get the vacation when you see those places in the world. You don't get that privilege. Why is it? Why is it? that we will sell our soul for money. I don't sell my soul. You got an employer? <laughs> Do you show up when you want to? Leave when you want to? Go work, do whatever you want to? Well, you know, there may be some that are getting away with it or they think they are. But hear me, your employer probably has a, an expectation of when you're going to start working, when you're going to, when you can get off, what time your breaks are, and he's got tasks he assign you. He doesn't say, why don't you think up something good to do today for the company? Rarely does anybody have that kind of latitude, but everybody's got parameters that they have to work in, in order to get a paycheck. So it's okay. I'm going to sell my soul to somebody else's will for money, but I'm not willing to obey the one that gave me life in the first place. And <laughs> that's, you know, oh, everybody wants to get out of high school. Yes, sir, buddy. We want to, we want to finish school. We want to get out. We want to be free. <laughs> and I've said to kids over the years, you're enjoying the freest your life is ever going to be right now in high school. Yeah, yeah, you got assignments and all that stuff. This is the freest it's, uh, it's ever going to be. This past Friday was graduation at the Naval Academy. And I was riding along with a friend of mine who was visiting from out of town. And I said, these guys, you know, you, you, you count the days to your graduation from the induction day, the first day you show up there. You know how long it's going to be to the day when you're going to graduate. And you point to that. But I said to this person, no matter how much those guys getting their diploma and, and, give, and, and, and swearing in again to serve and being commissioned and throwing their hats in the air, no matter how much they think they know what's coming, they have no clue. They don't have any clue. They don't have any clue what their life is going to be like. Yeah, there's a whole lot of rigidity at the Naval Academy, and they go overboard teaching you it's not your life. You asked to come here. We gave you permission to come. We put you through a rigid process to determine whether, whether we thought you were qualified to be here. You ask. We didn't come after you. And you're here now, and we're going to prove to you that your life's not your own. We own you. We're going to tell you when to get up. We're going to tell you when to go to bed. We're going to tell you what to wear. We're going to tell you what you can't wear. If the uniform of the day is carry rain gear, you don't go out without it. You're out of uniform. If it's raining, but they haven't changed the uniform of the day to wear rain gear, you put on your rain gear and they haven't changed the uniform of the day, you're out of uniform. If it's sunshine and 90 degrees out, but the uniform of the day is wear rain gear and you take it off, pack it up in your little bag and carry it, you're out of uniform. That's ridiculous. No, it's discipline. And the whole purpose of discipline is to prove you're not in control. And there are thousands and thousands of people every year that try to get in to the, one of the academies and submit themselves to that discipline. And all they're going to do is give you an education, a job that may get you killed. And yet, my God gives me life and health and strength. And he watches over me every day through the difficult days he allows and the, and the sunshine days that he blesses me with. And he's in control and he loves me. 
I've had people who were in charge of me in the military that I knew didn't even like me and gave me orders and demonstrated their power and ability to give me orders. And I knew they were doing special little things to prove to me, I don't like you. And I'm going to prove the power I've got over you. That's not my God. That's not his motive and attitude. He, he's not trying to play some power play. He's not strong arming me. He knows what's best for me. He knows what's best for me. And he wants me to have what's his best. Now, his best sometimes includes pain. His best sometimes includes sorrow. So his best sometimes includes difficulty. And you know the cliche, but it's not a cliche. Diamonds were one time coal, pieces of coal. And great, great pressure turned those pieces of coal into very valuable gems. The Lord designed all this in this life so that, you know, no pain, no gain. Now, why do we believe that when it comes to practicing football? Why do we believe that when it comes to weightlifting? Why do we believe that when it comes to power walking or uh, jogging? No pain, no gain. Why do we believe all that? Embrace it even. Glory in it. No pain, no gain. But then when God practices a principle that he brought into existence, we want to resent him for that. See, that's the problem when you live in this one life instead of the other. When you're living, believing you're in charge, everything God does is wrong. Everything God does is bad. And that's what we humans do. I've said this many times. We take the credit for all the good in our life, blame God for all the bad. We don't have any responsibility for the bad. It's not our choices. It's not anything. You know, we're just these helpless little pawns. That's why we have bad. And it's all God's fault. But you let anything good go on. Look at me. I deserve this. I produce this. I get all the credit. So we take the credit for the good, give God the blame for the bad. That tells the kind of life we're living. That tells our mentality. And I don't mean to be offensive, our deceived mentality. The Lord is trying to say something to us here that's very, very important. And then uh, Weiss Expanded Translation says it this way. I'm going to read the same verses again. Come now you who are saying, today or tomorrow we shall proceed to this city, and we shall spend a year there and buy and sell and make a profit. You are the class of men that does not know what shall be tomorrow and of what character is your life. For you, am, you are a mist which appears for a little time and then disappears. Instead of your saying, instead of your saying, or in the, it, it, I, I'm kind of dividing it wrong here, Instead, you should be saying, if the Lord so desires it, we shall both live and do this or that. Why? Because you're not in control of your last breath. You're not in control of the last time your heart beats. You're not in control of any of that. And if I'm not going to trust God with what we might call the little things, how am I trusting the big thing like breath, there's no bigger thing in your natural life than your next breath, except the next beat of your heart. Your next breath, the next beat of your heart are the two most important things in your life, in your natural life. They're the two most important things and you don't really control them. Oh yes, I do. Really? Hold your breath for five minutes. Go ahead. Choose to do that. Prove to me you're in control. Just prove to yourself you're in control. Don't hold your breath for five. Well, I can hold my breath for 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe some have practiced and they can hold their breath for a minute. And a few weird individuals have learned to hold their breath for two or three minutes. But let me tell you something. 99.9% .9 of us, before we get to the 60 second mark, against our decision and will, we're taking a breath because I don't control it. I don't control it. My father in heaven 
and in earth, my Father, who loves me, he provides all these things for me. The next breath I have, it's a gift from him. The next beat of my heart is a gift from him. The good things are a gift from him. The testing things, they're a gift from him. All of these things are making me understand what I'm not and who he is. All so that I can be in a relationship of fullness of life with him. Jesus said he came to bring life and that more abundantly. You don't, you, you may be, have become a Christian and therefore you got life from the spiritual dead. But let me tell you what, you don't have abundant life if you're running your life. If God's not in control of your life, you're not, you don't have abundant life. You don't have it. Because the only source of abundant life is the absolute confidence that my God is in control and I can trust him and that nothing is going to happen to me that he doesn't know about in advance and give his permission to. Those, whether I call those things good or bad. So I can trust him. David, in the, one of the most famous of all Psalms, the 23rd Psalm says, part of that is, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff may comfort me. You read that 23rd Psalms, it's the confession of a person that knows. I don't, I'm not in control of anything. He's in control of everything. And, and, and I, don't, I don't choose to resent him for that. I choose to embrace that. He is my shepherd. As a sheep, in, the, in that metaphor uh, or allegory, he is a sheep speaking of his shepherd. And David was a shepherd of natural sheep. He knew how much care he gave. He provided everything for those sheep. He protected them. He led them. He, he made sure they were in pastures that were green to eat. He led them beside still water so that they could drink safely. If they fell, he picked them up. Uh, he checked them for any kind of parasites or injuries or wounds. He took care of them. The Lord's not going to wrestle you for control of your life in this life. He's not going to do it. You want to be in control? Then you take all the credit and the blame for everything going on in your life. You want him to be in control? Then you can trust him that even on those bad days, he knew about them in advance. He permitted them for a purpose. And he wants you and I to know he's in charge. He's in control. He's saying to us, I got this. I got this. I know exactly the beginning of it. I know the end of it. I know the outcome of it. And he promised us this, Paul said, and we know that all things work together for good to everybody. Oh no, that's conditional to them who love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. I can't have faith that all things are going to work for good. Book, the Bible doesn't say all things are good, but it says all things are going to work for good. If he's in charge, if he's in control, amen. I'm going to read to you uh, one last translation before I close. This is the, it's a newer translation called the Passion Translation, beginning with verse 13. Listen, those of you who are boasting today or tomorrow, we will go to another city and spend some time and go into business and make heaps of profit. But you don't have a clue. I'm reading, this is what it says. But you don't have a clue what tomorrow may bring. For your fleeting life is but a warm breath of air that is visible in the cold only for a moment and then vanishes. Instead, you should say, our tomorrows are in the Lord's hands. And if he is willing, we will live life to its fullest and do this or that, if it's his will, if he is willing. But here you are, boasting in your ignorance. For to be presumptuous about what you will do tomorrow 
is evil. Actually, Jesus called it iniquity. So if you know of an opportunity to do the right thing today, yet you refrain from doing it, you're guilty of sin. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, Jesus said, Many will say to me, not, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name cast out devils, in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess or pronounce judgment unto them. I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you, or you never came into a relationship with me that I approved of. Depart from me. That is the execution of the sentence. And then he told all the reason why you that work iniquity. What is iniquity? Doing my will and not the will of the Father. So we may go to church today. <laughs> we may read our Bible. We may even go through something we call prayer. We may be the most moral person there is. But if we run our lives, we're denying who God is. We're denying what we're doing here. We're denying his plan, his purpose. We're denying his kingdom. And we're believing that all of this that he's done is only for the purpose of making our lives better by our definition of what that life is. So here's the question today. In this context, what is your life? What is your life? This is so very important for you and I to know this and understand this today and to respond to him. He loves you. He loves me. The scripture says that he said, I know the thoughts that I have for you, thoughts of good and not of evil, to bring you to an expected end. The journey in my 75 years has had far more difficult days, far more difficult days than what would be called easy days. But the confidence has always been, he has a plan, he has a purpose for me, and he's bringing me to an expected end in him, not only in this life, but in eternal life. So which life are you living today? The one that fully acknowledges him, that's fully surrendered to him, that's fully committed to him? Or are you living the life today where you're, you're deceived into believing that you're in control? Which life is that? Father, I thank you for this day, for this privilege, for this opportunity. I thank you for every person that is watching this, uh, this ministry right now live and those that will watch it at any point in the future. I am trusting, Father, that your spirit, by your word, is speaking to our hearts and opening our eyes and letting us see what's fact, what's real, and not this cloud of deception that we've been living in, believing things that are lies. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, you promised that you came to give us life, and that more abundantly. You've also promised that you would show us the way of life, that in your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I loose the spirit of grace, the spirit of the love of God, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, the spirit of conviction of our sins upon everyone who is hearing and receiving this word today that we might walk with you in this life and for eternity. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. God bless you.